I'm Dr. Christina Blanchard Moran. I'm with Global Health Liaisons and the founder of HIV COVID Talks. Today, I'm here to introduce you to our next speaker, Dr. Diana Gibb. She's Professor of Epidemiology at Medical Research Council Clinical Trials Unit at the University of College of London. She set up and undertaken a wide variety of networks of late phase trials and cohorts across Europe, Africa, the Americas, and Asia. She has focused on pediatric HIV, AIDS infection, and as well as tuberculosis, malaria, hepatitis, and bacterial infections. Today, she's gonna to speak with us about HIV COVID and how it's impacted local communities. And we'll speak briefly about Dr. James Jita Taki. Thank you and enjoy the talk. They come in with that often after they've had the disease. So it's a post-infectious um, inflammatory uh, condition. Responds to um, supportive care and steroids. Um, and a number of my colleagues have been collecting data on this, including from some of the African countries. I've not been directly involved in that. The death rate amongst those kids is very low, in hmm. fact. And uh, so we haven't seen much of that. Um, pregnant women, on the other hand, uh, um, can have quite a hard time with COVID. Um, and their babies can get in, can be you know born infected. Um, so one of the groups of children who may not do so well with COVID is the very very young, um, especially if they're born prematurely. But again, it's a rarity compared to what we see in the elderly. And and certainly as far as COVID's concerned, age is the most um, important thing. And it's why I guess it's hit. And many of our northern countries pretty hard because we've got old oh. people. And if you're an over eighty, observation. Yes. yes. If you're over eighty, you're a thousand times more likely to get sick. And we've got big populations of those older people, whereas you know it's a, um, it's a really less than five percent of of in many of the African settings. Um, uh, I think. Uh, you asked uh, uh, um, in, in your questions a, a little bit about what's happening with HIV in children um, worldwide. And when I first started working in Africa um, with James, in fact, people weren't even testing kids. Uh, kids were coming in very sick as babies with um, things like pneumocystis and cytomegalovirus diseases and dying very young. Um, but they weren't being tested. Uh, there wasn't mother to child transmission prevention, which has been a big thing, which has you know, rolled out in Africa now. I, I mean, it's still not perfect. And I think most of the work that needs doing now is not so much that we don't know how to really dramatically reduce mother to child transmission, not completely prevent it, but dramatically reduce it. But mm -hmm. that just needs implementing. And uh, to implement, you've obviously got to test women in pregnancy and then um, give put them on antiretroviral therapy. So the numbers of babies are decreasing, which is all good news. In terms of treatment for children, I think that, you know, actually HIV has shown some um, fantastic things uh, in terms of... Um, you know, when when the when, when we first started with those big studies with James, where you know, could you give ART to antiretroviral therapy to people in Africa? And um, there was the famous I, there was a famous uh, I think it was um, I can't remember which article in a, a U.S. paper which said, well, how can you give ART to people in Africa? They don't know what the time is. And oh yeah, I remember that. I remember that, and and yes. I got some wonderful pictures of people in villages knowing when to give their medicines because they were listening to the radio, and their so there's a station came on at a certain time or whatever. Of course, they can get, take their treatment, and they take it very well in Africa. So, so that was the early days, you know, of uh, and what the barriers we had to get over were. You know, the whole thing of 
um, providing licensing for generic drugs to make cheaper right. drugs and distribute them. Um, there was obviously support from PEPFAR and Global Fund for things to happen. Um, I've always been a great believer that they that, that things need to be done in ways that are appropriate for the setting. So our DART trial, which James, where James and I first met, was really saying, do you need to do all the fancy viral load and CD4 and you know liver function tests, et cetera, when you're giving ART, because you're not going to be able to do that in the village. And I think we showed quite conclusively that it was much more important to roll out treatment. And so that was our early things that we did. And then for children, it was about making um, appropriate formulations. And we needed to do that with generic companies making little baby pills. Mm -hmm. and trials like the, they're called the CHAPAS trials, but they were funded by the EU. Um, and they resulted in licensing of quite a number of these baby fixed dose combinations which weren't available they were available for adults but not for children giving liquid formulations to children across africa absolutely hopeless impossible yeah. impossible you can imagine grandmothers looking after the young children they haven't got glasses they can't even you know to, to actually pull things up in a syringe in a liquid and yeah. see how much to give impossible Mm -hmm. So the baby fixed dose combinations were really, really important. So I think the trials showing you could do that sort of thing. So providing the evidence for WHO guidelines, etc. Mm -hmm. The um, the uh, licensing, voluntary licensing, the innovator and generics working together, as we've just shown with the the new drug tolitegravir in our Odyssey trial. So things worked together. We were doing a big trial. We nested the pharmacokinetics to show the right doses according to simple weight bands um, in children. Uh, that was done. That was submitted to FDA and the EMA um, in order to. And then at the same time, the the innovator company were working with the Indian companies with Unite Chai to make the baby. Um, dispersible score tablets, which have become available really at the same time as the drugs became licensed by the FDA and EMA. And children, the evidence is there now, so WHO have already changed their guidelines and children won't be left behind. Now that contrasts a bit with what's happening with COVID vaccines. I'm really worried that there's, yeah. the qualities are awful and that, you know, the the what, five or six nations in the north are using 80% of the vaccines yeah. and that we just are not providing vaccines in the same way, I think, that, that, well, that there needs to be voluntary licensing and, and a local manufacture of licenses, of, of vaccines. And I think uh, AstraZeneca is probably, you know, um, uh, a one-off in terms of, I mean, most of them aren't doing it. Um, are that, or are not? Most of them are or are not? Most it. of them are not doing it. AstraZeneca certainly set itself up to be cheap and for lots of people to be able to make that vaccine. Is that a virus-based, is it, uh, or is that an M? Uh, M it's not an RNA vaccine. Oh, okay. Um, so Pfizer and uh, Moderna are the RNA vaccines. Right. right. Um, uh, AstraZeneca but, uh, is not. Uh, it's uh, and then there's the protein-based uh, vaccines like Novavax and the okay. Sanofi one. So there. I mean, it's fantastic what's happened with vaccines and COVID, but it just needs. We just need to keep the mantra going that until the world is vaccinated, nobody is safe. Right. That's really important. And it, and clearly they are going to be our way to uh, live with this epidemic, with this right. virus. I don't think this virus is going away. Um, in fact, in the UK at the moment, we are having 30,000 cases a day, but mostly people are not getting sick. But even a, even now, if you're double vaccinated, you can, you can get a bit of... A, a virus with it. Well, the point you made about 
uh, earlier. You were talking about in Zimbabwe, there was an observation that the children were basically carriers, but um, you know they weren't getting sick, and and yet there's not a vaccine for children. And so uh, I I understand what you're saying about how that. Um, how that could actually add to the problem, not having a vaccine for children could compound the issue. Well, I think people are beginning to go down. Uh, the, the issue is that for the individual, the risk benefit issues for COVID vaccines yes. are different according to age. I mean, if you're old, there's a no brainer that you need to have a vaccine or you need to be vaccinated to prevent you getting the complications of COVID. Young children obviously don't get very, you know, rarely get sick with COVID. Right. Um, and so from an individual point of view, that people have been more cautious about the safety of vaccines, which is quite right. Absolutely. But, Absolutely. but it is a complex area. And clearly, um, uh, I think that we will be wanting to get down to looking at children. and. And one of the things we were wanting to look at in this um, vaccine strategy study was maybe, you know, you can do a point of care antibody test. And those who've already had COVID, maybe you don't need to vaccinate them immediately or only give them one vaccine. Right. Um, so I guess one other thing to say about the impact of COVID on children is... Um, uh, the impact, which I think we've seen in the north as well, you know, enormous impact of COVID on the mental health of teenagers in particular. Um, and in the African setting, schools are often a safe place for kids. Um, uh, um, the, the issues of, uh, you know, safeguarding the issues of malnutrition um, and uh, the the economic and lockdown issues for kids I think have gone a little bit unseen and unheard really and I think they are really quite big in many of these countries because um, uh, schools have been shut in many countries for some time uh, in Uganda, I think they were shut for most of 2020, um, the schools and kids not going to school, um, issues for families about poverty, kids needing to go out to work if they're not going to school, etc. I think it's I think it's been pretty hard on kids. Yeah, I agree. Um, and on anyone who's especially the adolescent, because this is a time when they're peer sharing you know that's when they're getting to know their peers and so this must this is devastating for adolescents i would imagine um so what are the more immediate issues that that need to be addressed today for for um children uh with hiv without hiv <laughs> uh, but uh well certainly with HIV, I mean, you know, um, uh, as I said, uh, treatments have been getting better over time. Uh, this new drug, dolutegravir, which can be given once a day, is cheaper, much nicer to take. Um, ha uh, we've just finished this Odyssey trial and results come out during this year. Um, WHO have changed their guidelines and now what needs to happen, and it's quite difficult to do during COVID pandemic is is to implement those results. What we've it, what we've shown actually is that from 20 kilos and above, so you know, sort of six or seven year olds and, and above can take the adult dose.